Excellent. Awesome. Thank you, Emily, for getting us set up. Um, hey, everybody. Thanks for joining our session. I know um, it's uh, all different time zones around the world, so um, we're grateful that you're joining us, whether it's dinner time, nighttime, lunchtime, breakfast time, I don't know, whatever other times there are. I live most of my life oriented around food, so, <laughs> so that's, that's how I measure. Um, if, uh, if you would be uh, willing to, we'd love to have everybody just um, introduce yourself in the chat, get your institution, organization, district, state, um, any information that you're, you're willing to send. Um, we'd love to just know who's, uh, who's here with us today as we're talking about this, this conversation. Um, so we're going to give folks just one more minute. Um, hey, Amanda, <laughs> welcome. Welcome. Hi, Don. Thanks for joining. Um, uh, really quickly, just to introduce myself. Um, my name is Ethan Senek. I work with ISKME. Um, I'm the chief of staff there. Um, I um, have been working in the open education space for, for a while, but my background is mostly in sort of the campaigns and organizing side of things um, and, and advocacy work. Um, I'm gonna throw it over to uh, my co-host to introduce herself and then we'll get started. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today from all over. Um, I'm Mindy Boland, the Director of OER Services at ISCME, so my team and I run OER Commons and all of our partner services implementations. And uh, my background is in textbook publishing, but I have been working with ISKME for the past six years. Awesome. Thanks, Mindy. Mm -hmm. um, so you all are here um, for our talk, um, Beyond Open, Intersections with Accessibility, uh, Cultural Responsiveness, and Broader Educational Goals. Um, really quickly, just about our organization, ISPI is a nonprofit. We were founded um, back in 2002, I'm pretty sure. Amy is also here from our organization. <laughs> Amy, you should go check me on that. I think that's right. Amy says yes. Great. <laughs> I had that like pernicious moment of doubt where I was like, oh, I wonder if I typed that right. Um, we uh, do a whole bunch of work. Our, our mission is around making uh, education more um, participatory, equitable, and open. We're going to talk a little bit about how we go about that um, in a second, but um, many of you may know us from one of our biggest projects, which is OER Commons. So ISKME is actually the organization that helps run OER Commons. Um, we often do them diff uh, branded differently, um, but just so you know, we're, we're, <laughs> we're the team behind, behind that. Um, before I jump in, um, we really wanted to focus this session on some of our learnings around how to navigate these intersections. And before I jump into that, I wanted to talk just really quickly sort of from the 10,000 foot view, um, why this topic matters. And I think the biggest thing that we've realized in the last 10, 15, 20 years of our, our uh, advocacy around open education is that openness does not inherently uh, mean equity and justice. Um, you have things like the digital divide, you have potential for exploitation. Um, there's you know, great writings from Audrey Waters about that. Um, licensing itself doesn't actually say anything about representation or authorship. Um, and so there's a recognition that, uh, that one does not inherently lead to the other. And this gap has driven so much conversation about OER's intersection with other topics. Um, you know, you can just look at the themes of this conference to see how that conversation has shifted over the years. Um, and so we really wanna talk a little bit more about those intersections, how we've navigated them, what we've learned about uh, from our work in those spaces. Um, but the other thing just from the 10,000 foot view that I wanted to name is that, you know, OER has traditionally benefited from being a niche thing. Um, we don't get sucked into thorny convos. Um, most of our op opposition comes from, you know, publishers or, you know, just around concerns and confusion about copyright, things like that. Um, not to say that that's easy, um, but we have been able to avoid a lot of these much bigger, hard conversations that are happening in society today. And that safety is directly in tension with our goals of mainstreaming OER. 
right? In order to reach the mainstream, we need to engage in those bigger conversations. Um, and so navigating that tension is really interesting. If we want to mainstream, it means letting go of some of that safety um, and, and moving into harder conversations. Um, doing that is challenging. So as I said before, I think what we wanted to do today um, is just to talk about what we've learned in trying to explore um, those intersections and navigating those tensions. Um, we want to try to really focus in on just the, some specific learnings from those things. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit just about sort of the what that we do, but mostly dig into how and what we've learned. And then we're also going to recommend um, some useful resources and things um, that you can click over to right away if you want to get started and engage with those. Um, feel free to throw comments and thoughts in the chat. We're going to leave some time for discussion at the end. Um, but yeah, so, so that's sort of the 10,000 foot. And then I just wanted to share this one slide, sort of coming back down to the ground level. Um, this was the result of a study by EdWeek, which um, took place last year. So, so there has been some um, shift in the field since then. Um, but what they found is that 84% of teachers said that they were willing to teach or implement anti-racist curriculum, while only 14% of teachers said they felt like they had the professional development and the resources to do so. And I think you couldn't ask for a clearer depiction <laughs> of the potential for openness and the potential impact we can have, um, not just in uh, anti-racist work, but around accessibility and so many other intersections. Um, so we're just gonna be talking about a couple of those today. Um, my last quick note, we are gonna be using some US specific uh, maps and statistics and things, <laughs> but we, were intentional to phrase a lot of the learnings um, to apply more broadly uh, to, to everybody around the world. Um, so that's just a little bit about why this topic matters. And I'm gonna throw it uh, to Mindy to just talk to you, to you a little bit more about ISKME. Thank you, Ethan. So as Ethan um, correctly stated, ISKME was founded in 2002. Uh, we, we really started as a research institute looking at how teachers perform continuous improvement on curriculum over time. But um, about six years ago, we shifted to kind of a more sustainable services model. We still do grant and philanthropically funded research, but we offer a number of services, which you can see here on the left, um, to support educators in their, their journey through OER and open and ultimately through to uh, hopefully social justice. Um, this map here shows the states that we've been working in. So we have a lot of great coverage in the US. We've done professional learning, built hubs and microsites for these folks um, and continue to partner with them on their OER initiatives. We also work internationally. We do work with NGOs like UNESCO and Alexo. And uh, so while this is US specific in the map, we are we try to have a nice global view of the, of the work. Um, so talking today, we really want to think about um, accessibility and culturally responsive teaching. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how these um, this approach here on the screen has been kind of applied in that space. Um, with the tools and platform on OER Commons and on the microsites that we have built, we've integrated some tools to make authored authored OER more accessible, including an accessibility checker, which will kind of run through a resource that's been created and check it for um, accessibility attributes and give you an opportunity to remediate. We also developed EPUB3 downloads that are uh, braille friendly and screen reader friendly, working with our partners at CAS to ensure that even the MathML worked on those EPUB downloads. Um, We've developed some simple checklists for folks when they're creating resources that they can look at to ensure that they're kind of meeting all of the, the greatest hits of accessibility. And then in the, um, in the sort of the CRT realm, culturally responsive teaching, we're also developing a tool for identifying bias in sources. Um, in other areas, in our research work, we partnered with CAS to research how educators understand uh, accessibility metadata 
And we've worked with SCORE to research the best ways to apply accessibility metadata to STEM illustrations. Um, we also continue to do work on DEIA tools and internal work around inclusivity and unconscious bias. We can go to the next, yeah. One of the areas where we really started with services, and actually I think they originally started as being a grant funded thing that we did was professional learning. And um, a lot of our early professional learning was about, you know, what is OER? <laughs> How do I do OER? And uh, we really kind of built on that. We continue to talk about, you know, foundational open education practice and, um, and doing that kind of training, but we also, have been expanding the way that we think about our professional learning. So we've gotten past the idea of if we build you a hub or a digital library, everyone's gonna come and use it just like that. That doesn't really work. Um, and we found that as we do professional learning, it really brings folks into the platform and the work and makes it a part of their kind of regular workflows. Um, but in addition to that, we started doing um, these trainings around curriculum evaluation. So we were working with some of our partners to have their teachers evaluate resources for alignment to their state standards, for example. And as we did that, we thought, well, what are some other ways that you might evaluate resources? And um, started looking at doing evaluations for culturally responsiveness and for accessibility. Um, I think we're gonna get into our learnings later, but. We have done several iterations on the culturally responsive teacher training, um, finding that, for example, doing a two week academy with three webinars was just not enough time to do that kind of deep work. Um, so we really have been kind of evolving the way that we approach these trainings. And I think that's, you know, that's a big part of what we want to share with you today. Awesome. Thanks, Mindy. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, one thing I didn't say this explicitly, but we do uh, we do a ton of work in K-12, but we also work with lots of higher ed institutions. So um, while some of this stuff may seem more relevant to K-12, I think actually the learnings about engaging in these intersections and, and navigating them apply to, to, to both. Absolutely. Um, so that's a little bit just about who we are and, and, and what we do and how we learned <laughs> the things that we've learned and how um, much we have left to learn. Um, but we, what we wanted to do is just is zoom out and talk a little bit about um, two specific examples, so culturally responsive teaching and, and accessibility. Um, and so um, we're just going to share a couple of sort of broad stroke lessons that we've learned. Um, the first one being that this work is not one size fits all. Um, students are at different levels, educators are at different levels. There are different levels of comfort in engaging in these conversations, different, uh, different levels of ability and vocabulary around navigating this stuff. Um, and so, you know, and that's not even taking into account sort of regional, geographical, cultural differences. Um, a key piece of being successful in culturally responsive teaching is to be localized, be individualized, be responsive, which <laughs> obviously aligns with the, the, the term, um, to the needs of the learners of the institution or the district, um, whatever it is. And so um, this is both a challenge uh, because it means you can't just make one slide deck for everybody. You do really have to do the deep work of localizing and contexting for, for different environments. So I kind of touched on this a little bit. Uh, it takes time to do this work. You know, I, what, um, what we've found is that you have to kind of make, take the time for your participants to be comfortable in the conversation because it is, um, it's challenging and people can find it, you know, a little bit emotional or they may find themselves a defensive. So really taking the time to give people the space to become comfortable with this work, to understand that it's not sort of one linear path forward. There's gonna be some, some backslides and some sort of remediation as you go. And you need to take the time to do that and to lay a strong foundation um, of safety, of psychological safety for your participants and just to ensure that you kind of get the full breadth of the um, of the work. We've found that uh, you know building a team of facilitators that reflects the learner is really important, and it's not just you know 
It's not like ISKME isn't coming in and telling folks how to do this work. We like to partner with experts in the field, but we also like to bring in local experts who do this work in the state or the district or whatever the context is so that they can kind of connect better with the participants and ensure that they're really reflecting sort of the the learner's experience and the, the regional differences um, of the work. So building a strong team like that um, is really, really important. Did the other one come up? I have my thing over it. Okay. <laughs> um, also to identify resources that facilitate adaptation and localization. So, um, you know, there's a lot of resources out there and you want to be able to give uh, your participants an opportunity to think about how they might adapt those resources and make them more culturally responsive to their specific context. And so you want to find materials that are gonna let you do that so that it doesn't become frustrating. Um, the beauty of OER is that you can remix things. And so finding OER that can be remixed in the context of the training is really important as well. Um, I think we did some work allowing or having our participants just sort of flag resources that they were emergent in the space if they weren't able to um, remix them right on the spot, but having something to work with, you know, so that folks can really have kind of that applied approach to remixing for cultural respons responsivity is really important too. Yeah. Yeah, this is an open ed presentation after all. As you can kind of see, we're not, uh, maybe we're not saying it explicitly enough, but um, openness is sort of the lever behind the ability to do all of these things, right? We said, yeah. I said at the beginning, you know, it doesn't inherently lead to justice for, for, for a variety of reasons, but it enables the pursuit of that. And, you know, looking at the things on this list, it's not one size fits all, it takes time, you know, find local experts, subject matter experts, all of those things are enabled because of openness and because of open licensing. Yes. Um, but the next thing, the next big learning that <clears throat> I think we, we have is just to lead with humility and empathy. Um, as Mindy said, you know, we aren't the experts on local contexts. We aren't the experts on all cultures. We have blind spots ourselves. And it's so important to go into this work, sort of acknowledging that, you know, being ready to address it, being ready to learn and to make mistakes um, and to really make sure you're understanding where uh, the learners are and where the educators are. Um, so leading with humility and empathy, also very important. Um, the other thing that I wanted to do is just talk briefly about messaging around culturally responsive teaching. Um, as I'm sure everyone in the education space is aware, right, like there's a huge amount of um, heat and pressure around um, what gets taught in classrooms right now, you know, there's the unfortunate parallel with critical race theory because they share an acronym that muddies the conversation significantly. Um, but, you know, in doing this work, you do need to be super intentional about how you talk about it and how you message it. Um, and because clarity of message and clarity of narrative will help uh, prepare people for the conversation, make sure they're informed, make sure they're ready to take on this work. Um, so I wanted to share just sort of three tips that I have um, for talking about culturally responsive teaching, um, why it's important, why it's, you know, why it's worthwhile to do. Um, the first thing is to bring the context and ground the conversation in the fact that culturally responsive teaching has clear demonstrable benefits for students. You know, when students, uh, research shows that when their experiences and identities are seen in their learning materials and reflected, they reflected they do better. Um, and then the other piece of that is that this is a long standing proven educational practice. There's an amazing history of educators, authors, instructional designers discussing it, you know, all the way from Gloria Ladson Billings in the 90s to Geneva Gay and, and so many others um, leading the conversation around this. 
you know, the very first standard on the National Board of Professional Teaching Standards is to recognize individual differences in students and adjust your practice accordingly. Um, so grounding this work just in the fact that it has clear benefits, has a demonstrable track record is, is super important. Second thing is just to center this on the impact, right? Um, culturally responsive teaching is about providing an honest education that values all students. Um, you know, we were saying this before, but a one size fits all approach doesn't fit all students equally. And acknowledging that upfront you know, naming it as a way to provide more honest teaching that values a diversity of experiences. Um, you know, that's a step towards collective liberation and, and incredibly powerful. Um, the third thing is just that this is deeply embedded in state educational goals and institutional educational goals already. This isn't a, an, an, a fight you know, that we're just on the cusp of, this, is, this has already been included in state educational standards for years. Um, this is some data from a New America study on state educational standards. Um, as you can see here, 46 states have um, explicit educational goals around diversity and, expect and um, respecting differences, and 42 out of 50 states uh, have educational standards around culturally mediated instruction. So I think it's really important for us when we talk about this work, we context it as helping these institutions, helping uh, these districts, these states meet their goals rather than us coming in and telling them they should have different goals. So that's a quick, <laughs> that's the, that's the, um, that's the um, 10,000 foot picture of some of the learnings we've had. Um, I'm going to throw it back to Mindy, um, just because we wanted to come down from that 10,000 foot level and also offer just some specific um, resources and tools that you can start using tomorrow um, to get you started on this. Thanks, Ethan. So the first tool that we wanted to share with you, and I noticed that Barbara's on this call, so Barbara can... Uh kudos to you, but um, is the, the Washington Office of Superintendent Public Instruction, OSPE's um, Screening for Biased Content in Instructional Materials. I believe this was recently revised and it's um, one of their, they've done a great work in um, creating this tool for evaluating resources for bias. Um, and I, I know lots of folks have asked about sharing the presentation, all of these links and the presentation will be available. So uh, stand by for that. Um, ISME is working on a, a, our own framework that does take some of this into account as well as other tools similar to this. You can go on to the next one. Um, this is a tool created by Branch Ed, the equity rubric for OER evaluation. You can see the URL for it down there. And this is, if you're from higher ed, you may want to reflect on this a little more closely. This is designed for a higher educational setting. Um, but this is another, another rubric for, for checking out OER and evaluating it. Um, yeah, Branch Ed is a really cool organization. Their focus is on... Um, in, in their words, uh, amplifying the unique contributions that minority serving institutions offer in training highly effective diverse educators for America's classrooms. Um, so, you know, in terms of listening to the experts, <laughs> they're a, an amazing organization that we've been, we've been excited to partner with and um, they've created some obviously incredible materials. Absolutely. Um, this last one is the New America Culturally Responsive Teaching uh, Reflection Guide, and um, it includes these eight competencies for culturally responsive teaching. And I just wanted to, you know, this has been foundational in the way that we've designed our professional learning around CRT, really looking especially at the first four uh, competencies here as they apply most directly to curriculum. But I think this is just one of those one of those papers that has become kind of a, a cornerstone of this work and something that's really been valuable for our, for our team as we design trainings. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna pivot just to talk about a different example and kind of dive into that, which is around accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, and we've learned sort of a, a handful of, there's gonna be obviously some, some significant parallels with our work around culturally responsive teaching, um, but some different things that we wanted to take a second to highlight as well. Mm -hmm. 
So I mentioned earlier some of the um, the research that we've done with educators around accessible metadata and um, I think that relates here because we found, you know, a lot of educators uh, when they're evaluating resources for accessibility are not exactly sure on how to talk about it or how, what to look for to evaluate resources. They've often come at, um, at the accessibility needs through specific student accommodations. Um, so we found that having this nice foundation um, where you can give them the foundation knowledge they need and then those tools to implement it is critical because this work is very complex. It's multi-layered. It's not just about skills. It's also about developing that confidence in this space. So, um, you know, being able to leverage can build community in these spaces um, through evaluation, sort of developing this, this a, a dialogue with educators for evaluating resources can be really helpful. So weighing the differences between born accessible and retrofitted content. Um, one of our partners at CAST, Luis Perez, has a wonderful metaphor for this that I just wanted to call him out because I'm not going to pretend it's mine. But um, if you think about when you are making blueberry muffins and you want to have all of the blueberries mixed into your muffin, right? So you want it to be born that way <laughs> with, with a good, um, a good, a good assortment of your blueberries. If you're going back in and you're retrofitting something that's already there, you could try putting all your blueberries on top or you could cut it in half and kind of smear them in the middle, but it's still gonna be not as good as the kind of born, born accessible blueberry muffin that has been thought through from the start um, with, the, with accessibility in mind. Right, and I, and I think, um... You know, we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec, but a, a big part of this too, an accessibility work, culturally responsive teaching, um, sort of all of these intersections, it's, it's so important um, to work towards better, um, not towards perfect. Um, this opens up a huge <laughs> philosophical can of worms about, you know, how, um, how we can move along our own journeys of discovery towards liberation and, and rejecting racism and, and all of that. Um, but it's so important to just take that first step. Um, the reality with this work is that the goalposts will move. And they should move as we learn more, and we uh, as, as we learn more and discover more. Um, and so, I think going into efforts around accessibility, around culturally responsive teaching, it's so important to just acknowledge that upfront with yourself and with your organization or your institution. Um, you can't just uh, do a checklist. Um, and be done. There's tech checklists that we're going to talk about in a sec that can be helpful, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not like you check a box and you're done. These goalposts will hopefully keep moving and keep advancing and keep pushing that boundary. Um, so just being upfront about that is, is super important. Um, the, the last thing in this sort of goes back to what Mindy was talking about, the tension between openness and accessibility. Um, with open education, um, creation of resources is so distributed and it comes from a variety of places and it can be piecemeal, it can be um, ad hoc, it can be community-based. Um, it can come from so many different ways, decentralized, distributed. Um, at the same time, what, what is sort of needed for good accessible content is to have someone owning, um, owning that responsibility. You know whether it's the original author, whether it's you know someone else coming in and adapting the work. Um, this goes back to what Mindy was saying about born accessible versus baked in, or born accessible versus <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, retrofitted is the term we use for it. Um, and so there is a tension that we do have to be mindful of because um, you know if a work isn't born accessible if a resource isn't born accessible, there is effort and work required to get it there to a point where it is accessible to all uh, in line with the theme of this conference. And so it's just something to be really intentional, well, intentional about and mindful of um, that there is, does need to be an ownership and responsibility there. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, I'm going to ask Mindy, and he's going to run through a couple of just practical examples that um, you can look at to just start, um, start your journey on this. Um, and again, we will share all of these links um, out as well. Yes. 
So CAST has created a multitude of wonderful resources for uh, creating accessible documents and presentations and content more broadly. And uh, we have the pleasure of having being partners with them and they have a hub on OER Commons where you can access all of the resources that they have created to support accessibility. Um, so that is the first one there. The Open Author Accessibility Checker, I mentioned this earlier, it's something that is built into Open Author, which is the authoring tool on our OER Commons platform. And what it does is you click this button in the top left corner and it will run through your content and tell you where things are not accessible and give you an opportunity to remediate it right there and fix it. So it's a wonderful tool if you are authoring content and want to just give it that last check. Again, it's not a checklist, but this is a way to, to kind of go through your resource and keep you mindful about the, the things you need to consider. Um, the last one I wanted to call out is the BC Campus Accessibility Toolkit. Um, this is a wonderful full press books um, about accessibility. We have taken some of the highlights and made it a short checklist on OER Commons for folks who are authoring with, OE, with Open Author, but this is a deeper look at um, making sure that your content is accessible and that you are meeting all of the needs um, of your learners. Awesome. So um, that was obviously a, a ton of content <laughs> and um, you know, I think there were there were so many elements of this that we want to talk about and, you know, would love to talk about more, even just defining CRT and the different elements of that, defining accessibility and the conversations. Um, so we tried to structure this <laughs> to just be really uh, direct and kind of downloading some of the um, best practices, some resources that you can use. Uh, and that sort of thing. Um, this is Mindy and, and my contact information, but um, we did actually end um, just one minute past where we wanted to be in order to save 10 minutes for, for discussion and for questions. Um, so um, I would love to, uh, if folks want to come off of mute or add comments into the chat, um, there's a couple of questions here that I, I would be really curious your answers to. Um, what resonates with you um, from this conversation? Are there things that stood out, you know, advice that you would share on top of what we talked about? Um, if, if anyone wants to come off of mute or, or drop comments in the chat, we would love to just take a few minutes to kind of uh, hear from all of you and, and answer questions if, if, if you have any. Right, we have a question from Amanda in the chat. I'm curious if folks have used open pedagogy as a way to adapt their content to be culturally responsive. So I'm, I'm guessing this is sort of asking if there's anybody on this call who's used sort of uh, open pedagogy, pedagogy student uh, generated content. I don't know <laughs> off the top of my head, Mindy might. I think that it has been an approach that we've seen in our professional learning where you can kind of use an existing resource and then frame it, <laughs> you know, to kind of have that teaching moment around the cultural responsivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And, and if other folks want to chime in on that, please, please do. There's a great comment um, from Jennifer in the chat, work towards better, not perfect. My school won't allow OER unless it is perfect in regards to accessibility. Um, there's fear of getting sued. I think this is this is a really good point, and and thanks for um, thanks for naming that. Um, you know, there's a difference between I think legally mandated accessibility and what right like perfect accessibility is, and and I think maybe we could have framed what we said mm -hmm. there a little bit differently um, because you know the there you know, when you think about perfect accessibility, you kind of get into this much bigger conversation around universal design. And there's so much actually beyond what the legal requirements are um, that I, I think that's sort of the, the, the um, area we were trying to talk about. Um, of course, there are sort of legal requirements for resources that's been a huge challenge for a lot of institutions and, and for a lot of educators. Um, and so, you know, hopefully some of the tools we've talked about today and some of the um, 
some of the learnings we've had can help towards towards that, but also push beyond it. Um, and I think that's what we were trying to get at. Um, Jennifer in the chat says something that resonated with me, the goalposts should continue moving as we improve. Um, in my work as an OER librarian, I've learned that getting into OER really makes you reevaluate your teaching. Um, yes, so important, right? Like if, if you reach the goalpost and then stop and you're done, you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and your I mean, goalposts aren't correct. I think we've um, seen just in this open ed conference so far, and I'm sure for the rest of the week, like how much you know the goal court goal post can be expanded and made more inclusive <laughs> if that makes mm -hmm. sense um but it, there's always more to, boundaries to push that way I, I will say though um this is this is not actually specific to open education but more broadly um just the idea of taking a moment to celebrate when you do pass you know when you do make it through the goal posts um you know of course, there are, there's more field after that. We're getting very off of our sports ball metaphors here. Because <laughs> um, usually there isn't any field past the goalpost. But, um, <laughs> you know, of course, there's so much room and, and direction that you can go um, past that. But taking a moment also to celebrate wins is like the number one way to head off burnout and exhaustion. So like celebrate those small victories. This is not specific to open ed, more organizing and, and this work in general, um, but just something I think so important to name. Um, um, Alyssa White says, uh, what advice do you have for sharing the importance of culturally responsive teaching and the importance of centering accessibility? I've felt resistance from faculty and other disciplines as if they do not have the time or resource to prioritize this work. <laughs> what was the one of the researchers for culturally responsive was just that it's just it's simply good teaching. <laughs> that probably wouldn't be a very good answer <laughs> for, for someone that was resistant, but um, it's almost as though it's not that it, it that it requires prioritization; it requires integration with the creation of resources. So. Um, <laughs> I can see that, Alyssa. Um, but uh, it's it, the, the part of making your resources resonate with your students is them being able to, uh, to um, respond to them and see themselves in them and use them. <laughs> um, I don't know what else I would add to that, but yeah. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, there's a great comment from Jennifer about don't, you know, it, using sort of academic freedom and ownership and pride in classroom don't outsource your teaching um really good um the other thing i would say is uh, and this gets you know again into sort of the bigger organizing questions around this work um but there are different you know there are different sort of stakeholders and constituencies and people along that spectrum um you know there are the folks who get it who are ready to do this work you know they are yes they just want resources and they want you know to to have really good you know deep conversations and that sort of thing and i think super important to offer programs and to have organizations in the space that facilitate those conversations mm -hmm. um you also have a, a really big body in the middle who is amenable to this but is afraid um, or, you know, unsure, they aren't super confident, they're worried about a lawsuit, or they're worried about, you know, uh, this proliferation of bills around critical race theory. Um, you know, we just saw some of the news out of Texas and, and other states around the country about that. And so we do also sort of message differently to the folks in that part of the spectrum than we do to the folks on the end here. And you know, much more of that conversation is around understanding it, sort of the initial exploration. It's about evaluating, not necessarily creating and being the first through the door. Um, you know, there's just tons of movement that those folks mm -hmm. can do as well. Um, so it's just really important to sort of think about messaging differently and how you talk differently to different people along the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you all for all of these awesome comments. I see tons of tons of stuff in the chat. 
Um, like I said, uh, we are going to post these slides and all of these links in the SCED so you can come back to it and reference it in the future. Um, but thanks so much for, for joining and sharing uh, as well in the chat. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much for a great presentation. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.